originally I named it something about the legal drug trade in the UK because that's what sort of sparked my interest in this kind of stuff. But then I went to more of like a broad, yeah, look at it. Um, right, so first let's have a drug discovery. These are a few ways that um, drugs are discovered. You know, by accident, which is sort of what I showed there with penicillin, he noticed that uh, this mold that was growing killed the bacteria. Okay. Um, screening, so you have pharmaceutical companies making these libraries of chemicals, just pumping out libraries of chemicals. Uh, and then they say, oh, we need a drug for this. Let's just screen our thousand, thousand chemicals library until we get a hit on something. So that's how it's done in sort of big pharma nowadays. Uh, Nature, you, uh, things that have been used for a long time, typically originally from nature. So if you can look at fermentation, alcohol, um, it's one way to get a drug. Biomimetic is sort of the same idea. You look at things in nature, and then you try and design a drug based on something uh, that works, that's fine in nature. And then design analogs, which is what I'm going to focus on. It's uh, you take a drug that already works, and uh, make analogs of it, and I'll explain that to you in a bit. So first I'm going to touch on the FDA approval of drugs. Once they go through the, all these drug discovery methods, they um, pick the drug, and it has to be approved by the FDA in the States, which is sort of the most stringent guidelines in what a lot of countries, a lot of things we go by are FDA approved. It's really like the inspection to prove the drug's like effectiveness and safety. It's typically at least 10 years once you find out a drug works in some way to getting it on the market. Uh, first you have preclinical trials uh, where they do animal testing. They find out like what the lethal dose is, um, see if it works on like mice and other uh, model organisms. And then if that all goes okay, you can submit it to the FDA and they'll let you do clinical trials. Phase one of clinical trials, uh, they give a very, very small dose, a really low, low percentage of what they found was the LD50 in mice. LD50 is a um, lethal dose in 50% of the population, so it killed half. They give an extremely small dose to really healthy individuals and see if there's any side effects uh, in really small amounts. If that all goes okay, then they'll start looking into patients. We can move on to phase two. Um, you. Here they sort of test like formulation two. There's a huge difference in the way you take a drug. Um, if you look at bioavailability, say of methamphetamine, typically it's smoked, and in that case, you only get, I don't know, 30% or so of the drug actually getting into your brain and being active. If you inject it, it's 100% bioavailability. So that's why um, if there's some sort of overdoses and things that people don't know what drug they're taking and take it the wrong way. Uh, next you have phase three, which is the huge study, uh, double bind, placebo trials, um, really proves the drug's effectiveness after you've sort of shown that it's mostly safe. Um, you require hundreds of patients, half of them aren't even taking the real drug, you have to keep in mind the placebo effect. And then after that, they submit another thing to the FDA and maybe it'll get approved. Um, very small percent of drugs that start at this stage actually make it to this stage. Usually something goes wrong and they just throw it out from there. Then phase four, uh, after it's been approved, they still test it, they still look at it because they could have missed something, things can go wrong. So uh, these drugs are constantly being under scrutiny. And even with all of this, there can still be huge mistakes that kill tons of people. So <laughs> they, uh, Example of that is Biox, uh, Rofcoxin. Uh, it was from Merck. Um, it was treatment for, osteo for osteoarthritis and acute pain. It was on the market for five years, so it was in that phase four for five years. Um, it was like this wonder drug for people and their <coughs> arthritis pain and uh, prescribed to 80 million people. And there were some inquiries into it. Uh, people noticing heart problems, not really sure if it's connected. It actually takes a long time to prove that one thing actually causes another thing. So they did this huge extra study on it, 
and found that after, I think, 18 months, the number of heart attacks, if you were taking Vioxx versus if you weren't, the slopes changed and basically increased risk of heart attack. And they looked back at it all in the five years it was in market and estimate <coughs> between 88,000 and 139,000 heart attacks. Oh, sorry, that's wrong at the end. It should say 30 to 40% were likely fatal. So this killed tons of people. And it was tested and thoroughly looked at and sort of, this is sort of to give you um, an idea of these designer drugs that are coming out. No one's ever tried them before. Um, how scary that can really be. So what are analogs, these design analogs? Um, online definitions, you can find that they're compounds in which one or more atoms, functional groups, or substructures have been replaced with different ones. It's really, really vague. Um, analogs of chemicals that are synthesized for illicit human use are referred to as de designer drugs by the media. So people that take um, current drugs, modify them slightly, and then sell them to people. And typically they'll have the same effect um, for a little while, but then bad things could start happening. So here's an example of an analog that was designed for like illicit human use. This is PCP. It's actually a kind of cool structure. I never knew it looked like that. I think it's cool, but I'm in chemistry as well. <laughs> and, um, here's PCE. So this is a hyperidine ring, um, six member. And here, it's just two carbons instead of all of these. And you've got, now you have to fill that in with the hydrogen. But you can see how these are structurally very similar and might do the same type of thing. So that's why it was synthesized. So this is from a paper from people that did a PCP binding study. So they um, took a rabbit or something and injected it with something that was like PCP. And when anything goes into your body, your body starts making antibodies for it, uh, if it's a virus or anything. So this rabbit made antibodies to recognize the thing that was like PCP, and then they isolated those from the rabbit and, uh, tried, and s tried to see if it found the PCP, which it did, and they managed to get an X-ray crystal structure from it. So I know it's kind of like not a good diagram, because it's sort of from a while ago, but I'll point out like the important parts. So if you remember the structure of PCP, um, this might not mean anything to you, it might, but it's very uh, hydrophobic. There's not a lot of places here that water can interact. If you see a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds, those are called hydrophobic. They don't interact well with water. But they interact well with things that are also hydrophobic. But here's one thing that could be considered hydrophilic. It can interact with water, the nitrogen. So here, you show there's one residue in this antibody, um, this oxygen on this carbonyl group, that is interacting with the nitrogen. Uh, and that's the only hydrophilic interaction. And then you have one other thing in this antibody is binding to water. Um, then you have all the hydrophobic interactions. So basically, this is where PCP is binding, and all around it are these hydrophobic um, amino acid residues, things that make up the protein or the antibody. Um, and they're sort of holding it there, keeping it in place, really good interactions. So here's a different view of it uh, that I made up. Um, you see, this is the nitrogen, this is the benzene ring, and uh, you see all these hydrophobic amino acid residues are around here. All these rings that you see, typically hydrophobic. And then, I made it up so that it would look like the PCE. So you can see how it's really, really similar, and maybe it has the same effect as PCP. But maybe it has other effects. Maybe it doesn't bind as well because there's not enough hydrophilic or hydrophobic um, atoms here. You wouldn't get the same interactions with, say, this guy as you would with that. But maybe there's an extra interaction. Maybe this hydrogen that's now here in the PCE combined with another amino acid residue that I just sort of made a line going to nowhere, but I showed it here. Um, maybe it binds a lot better. Maybe it has much stronger effects. So you can only take like a small amount compared to what you would take for PCP, and it would have a huge effect. Um, possibly like overdosing effect, you don't know. Also, there's possibility of uh, the nitrogen 
could be ionized, and that actually might affect its water solubility. Maybe now it's not water soluble. Um, maybe it can't really, maybe that, or sorry, it would be water soluble. Now it would be really water soluble. Maybe it can't cross into your membranes anymore. Uh, can't even get through the blood rate barrier. So, I don't know, there's so many options. You have no idea what's going on with these things. That's just an example. So now I'm going to talk about control of um, precursors and analogs. So by precursors, I mean the things that you basically have starting material, you do a few chemical reactions, then you get your product, your drug that you want. Precursors are things that would be on the way to that drug. And then the analogs that we talked about. Um, <coughs> control of precursors, they, basically it's for synthesis prevention. It's like how they control pseudoephedrine and cough syrup and things so that you can't make meth from it. I'll talk about that a little later, but basically it's to prevent you from synthesizing these drugs. And then control of analogs. Um, it differs in different countries, and that's why there's problems between borders. And you see different problems in the UK than you do in the US. The US has a Federal Analogs Act, um, part of the Controlled Substance Act, that says that analogs of these illegal drugs are also illegal. And there's another version of the act that came out in 1986, too, basically saying the same thing. Um, Australia, it, it's sort of vague, though, so. There's a lot of um, legal issues. Like people go to court and say, "Is this really an analog of this?" Well, like I don't know. It's based on the vague description. It, they're long legal battles. Uh, but in Australia and New Zealand, they have a different approach. They preemptively ban drugs um, and chemicals, just completely based on their structure. They say, "Well, hypothetically, this chemical could do the same thing as this because it has a similar structure." So we're going to ban it. So they have tons of these banned chemicals that haven't even been made yet. They have no idea what they are, but they're illegal already. And so that can bring about a lot of trouble. What if you find out that one of these things is actually amazing for a cure for Alzheimer's or something, and it's already illegal. It's really hard to take something that's illegal and make it legal again. It's a lot easier to go the other way, which is what Germany, Canada, and the UK do. They ban new drugs as they come along. Um, which seems to be working okay in Canada so far, but they're having a lot of trouble in the UK right now and for the past few years. Um, so this designer drug trade, basically these manufacturers there are selling these legal highs. They're making analogs of um, illicit drugs and manufacturing them, synthesizing them because they're starting to get really good technologies for this in their garages or wherever they do this. and. Uh, selling them faster than the government can prohibit them. So it's becoming a real problem. Like, you can go to head shops there and they'll sell you an alternative for cocaine, alternatives for PCP and things, because technically they're legal. They, the government can't do anything about it. So it's not just, you know, you can go buy salvia or something. But people are buying these sort of hard drugs. Just off the street. Um, one example is spice. I, I never heard of it. Does anyone? <coughs> Yeah, okay. Um, an herbal smoking blend. This, the Chinese herbal smoking blend is how they um, advertise it. And it's been sprayed with chemicals that mimic THC. I couldn't find what chemicals, but, sorry, do you know? Yeah, they're like JWH and then numbers. JW? It's like JWH18 and then there's like... <coughs> I, mean, I, got I don't know what okay. for. I think they're agonists. Hmm? I think they're agonists, like THC. Yeah, yeah they're, they're most likely just structural analogs. <coughs> like THC, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of them have a lot stronger effects than just THC. So another thing they do there is mislabeling. So like with mephedrone, they'll label it as plant food. Because technically, I guess it can be used as plant food. Then they sell it, um, they can sell it in mass quantities labeled like that, and no one's the wiser, but until they are, and they figure this out. But that's how they're, <laughs> that's how they're doing a lot of these things. Um, and, sorry, and getting away with it. Um, and sort of, the UK, it, from the article in 2009, it seemed like they were aiming towards having more of a thing like the FDA. And they weren't going towards this blanket classification like in New Zealand and Australia, like I was talking about. They weren't 